continue our study of the book of Hebrews on our Wednesday service here. And today we're going to take a look at chapter 2, which has a warning about some dangerous drifting that can float us away from our faith. Verses 1 through 4 say this, So, we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself, and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. Chapter 2 starts out by saying, since the message of angels from the Old Testament is not to be ignored, how much more should the message be received that is from God's own Son? And because of some dangerous drifting from their faith, some people were in danger of being blown away from their moorings and drifting away from the truth of Christ. So in verses 1 through 4, we have two important points about God's gift of salvation. The first point is for those who have not accepted God's gracious gift. In chapter 1, it is established that Jesus is superior to everything and everyone that he is the exalted one, that it was Jesus that purged our sins, that Jesus is the creator, and that he is the only one worthy of worship. It's as if the writer of Hebrews could go no further in his message without an invitation to respond. Essentially, the question now being asked is this, Jesus is all of this and more. Now, what are you going to do about it? This appeal is to the ones who have heard the truth about Jesus and who know it is true, however, have not yet made a commitment to him. Drifting along through life is so quiet and easy. However, not making a commitment to Jesus also means being condemned. All that a person needs to do to go to hell is continue to do nothing. And that person on their way to hell will need to have walked by the cross first. People in their sanctified imaginations will be standing before God upon their deathbed and saying, But God, I've always believed you existed. I've tried to live a good life as much as I could. I never hurt anyone intentionally, at least not very often. To which our Lord will reply to them, just as he did to the same people in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 23, who did not fully accept him as well. Jesus will say this, But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. Unfortunately, it will be just another case of too little, too late. Now the second point of application is to those who are in danger of neglecting the salvation they have received. This passage not only has application for the person who has not accepted the gift of salvation, but also for the one who is neglecting their faith. So now the question becomes, when am I guilty of neglecting my faith? We first become guilty of neglecting our faith when we continue to hear spiritual truth. However, this truth then has no impact on our lives. The vivid warning in verse 1 is written in the language of the sea, suggesting the image of a ship whose anchor has broken loose from the ocean floor and is dangerously drifting away. The process is not dramatic or sudden, but rather a process that is insidious and quiet. Drifting is still a besetting sin today. In truth, 
the problem for today is not so much a hearing problem, but rather a heeding problem. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, Jesus says this, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. A good example of careless inattention to truth is actually seen every day on board any commercial airliner. Before the plane leaves the runway, the flight crew goes over the safety instructions. How to fasten the, how to fasten the safety belts, how to put on an oxygen mask, and how to use your seat cushion as a flotation device, etc. I can already picture some of your eyes glazing over already. And why is that? Two reasons actually come to mind. First, if you've traveled by airliner a few times, you've heard it all before many times. And secondly, the need for that information seems too remote to merit our interest. So the Bible is telling us, you need to be more eagerly anchoring your lives to the things that you have been taught. Otherwise, your ship of life and faith will drift right past the harbor and be wrecked. Folks, we need to keep in mind that there's no such thing as standing still spiritually. Life is not like a lake with still waters. Life is more like a river that is constantly flowing and, and pulling us away from the things of God. So in truth, we are either moving forward spiritually or we are drifting backward, away from God and the things of God. Our faith is no good if it isn't directly affecting and impacting our lives. The second way we can become guilty of neglecting our faith is when we begin to think that we have no sin problem at all. Verse 2 tells us this, For the message of God delivered through angels has always stood firm, and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. The point being made is that the law given by God's messengers proved reliable and brought judgment on those who disobeyed. So how much greater must the consequences of disobedience be to those who neglect the message of salvation made through his own son? Warren Wearsby, one of the greatest preachers of all time, preached a sermon series on the sins of the saints. After the service, Reverend Wearsby was severely reprimanded by one of the members of the church afterwards. And that person said this, After all, sin in the life of a Christian is different from sin in the lives of other people. To which Warren Wearsby then replied, Yes, it is worse. How did we ever get to the point in the church where we think a Christian's sin doesn't stink and they don't need to be confessed anymore. The Bible tells us this in the first book of John, chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what does it mean to confess our sins? That word confess comes from the Greek word homologeto, which means to proclaim the same conclusion. We are to say the same thing that God does. 
When God in his word says that the thing we do is sin, we then need to take a good hard look at it. We then need to homonojeo and confess. You're right, Lord. I say the same thing that you say. It is sin. That's what it means to confess your sins. Tell God that, that you want to say the same thing about your sin that he says about it. Then when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins. And we can't for a single moment think that we have no sin problem in our lives. There has been only one perfect and sinless person in this world. And because none of us are Jesus, even though Jesus is inside of us, we need to constantly and continually repent of any known sin. Robert Robinson wrote these words in the hymn, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, which quite accurately explains our spiritual situation. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Now let's take a look at the second part of chapter 2 in verses 5 through 18. Verses 5 through 7 tell us this. And furthermore, it is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in one place the scriptures say, What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Or a son of man that you should care for them? Yet for a little while you made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. The world today tells us that we are creatures of evolution and that over the course of billions of years we have evolved from some kind of mud guppy to our present state of existence. So, in effect, this logic states that we're not much better than any of the other members of the animal kingdom. However, the Bible tells us in verse 7 that yet for a little while you were made a little lower than the angels. When God created human beings, he made us just a little lower than the angels. Now this does not mean that a person is lower than angels spiritually or lower than angels in importance to God. A person is lower than angels only in that we are physical and they are spiritual. And yet, only for a little while are people lower than angels. As great and as glorious as angels are, they will not rule the world to come. Angels must one day yield to we human beings. God's ultimate plan for his kingdom to be, is to be ruled by redeemed men and women. So the book of Hebrews then quotes Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, to prove God's original intention for mankind. And the Bible tells us this. What are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority. Then if we go back, very first chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verses 17 through 28, we're told that we are given rule over the whole world. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. However, then 
Adam sinned and everything became twisted and distorted and humankind lost its dominion over nature. As a result, Romans chapter 8 verses 19 through 22 tell us this. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Although sin has interrupted God's intentions for the human race, it has by no means changed them. So Hebrews chapter 2 now introduces us to four reasons why Jesus came to this world. The first reason is that Jesus came to regain our destiny. Verses 8 through 9 tell us this. You gave them authority over all things. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Verse 8 reminds us that although the intention of God may have been to have all things in subjection to humans, that is certainly not how things stand now. Right now, all things are not subject to us. We were meant to have dominion over everything. However, we do not have it presently. We are now frustrated in, by our circumstances, being defeated by our temptations, and are surrounded with our own weakness. In this present world, we are not what we are meant to be. Everything is obviously not in subjection to humankind. That is, not yet. In verse 9, we read the words, what we do see is Jesus. Jesus is God's answer to humankind's dilemma. Jesus came to this world to suffer and die for our sins and to restore the destiny and dominion that was lost as a result of that sin. So this brings us to the second reason Jesus came to this world, and that is to relate to our difficulties. Verses 10 through 13 tell us this. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. He also said, I will put my trust in him, that is, I and the children God has given me. In verse 10, we read, and it was only right. And that word right comes from the Greek word prepo, which means something that is suitable and proper. So the text is saying that it was suitable and proper through the death and sacrifice of Jesus for God to bring humans back to God's original design, to bring all who believe back into glory and to regain our destiny. So this brings us to the third reason Jesus came to this world, and that is to release us from bondage. Verses 14 through 15 tell us this, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. 
And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Because Jesus came into this world, we were not only in bondage to sin, but also in bondage to death. And verse 15 defines, identifies the problem as the fear of dying. Even for people who say they do not believe in the reality of God, death is terrifying. This does not mean that most unbelieving people lead lives of conscious terror. All this means is that these people who are enslaved by the fear of death will find ways to avoid the intolerable fear that they have. For most people, it is simply to live in denial. Most people simply do not let themselves think about what is absolutely inevitable, which is their own death. They are driven, consciously and subconsciously, to shut their eyes and blank their minds to every thought that they are going to die and will have to give an account to God. So this really is a form of slavery, a slavery to the fear of death. The fear of death enslaves everyone, either into a dream of denial or escapism or a narcotic release, unless something happens which deals with that reality of death. Verse 14 says that something has happened, though. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. The word translated break comes from the Greek word katharterto, which means to deprive of influence and power. Now, this phrase, break the power, is what is in the tense called the aorist tense. And that means that something was done in the past that still has ongoing and lingering results. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins and arose on the third day, Satan lost his grip and his power of death forever. In addition, Satan also lost the power of threat and fear of death that he placed on us. So friends, hold tight to your heart this promise from the Bible in the first book of Corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 through 22 and verse 26. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into this world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. And also, these words from verses 54 through 57. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, for all those who believe, Jesus has released those believers from the bondage of sin and the sting of death. And because of this awesome act of love by our Lord Jesus, any judgment beyond death does not have to be feared. Now, a fourth reason Jesus came to this world is to restore us from defeat. Take a look at verses 16 through 18 from Hebrews chapter 2. We also know that the Son did not come to help angels. He came to help the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, 
It was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. According to verse 17, by dying for our sins, Jesus was performing the work of a high priest by offering a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. But to understand what, what's happening here is we need to remember what the high priest of Israel did. It was his job, once a year on the Day of Atonement, to enter into the most holy place and there pour the blood of the sacrifice on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, which was representative of the presence of God among his people. Thus, God would see his people through the blood of that yearly sacrifice. Jesus came to this world as a once and for all sacrifice for our sins. So for all believers, God now sees us and our sins through the blood of his one and only son's sacrifice upon the cross. When Jesus died, his death bore all of our guilt and the punishment for our sins. He who had no sin took upon himself the sin of all of us. And verse 18 gives us a result of that sacrifice. Since he himself has gone through suffering and temptation, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Now that word help comes from the Greek word wetheo, which means to come to the rescue of. The context of the word is in reference to a mother who runs to their child who is crying and in need of help. Jesus also runs to us as his Holy Spirit when we cry out to him in times of testing and temptation. Having lived in human form, Jesus also had to endure trials and temptations. And so Jesus completely understands and is more than able to help us in our time of need. Chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews summarizes why we have a need for Jesus and then explains how he is perfectly able to deal with the sin, testing, and temptation in our lives. And by his sacrifice on the, on the cross, for all those who believe, Jesus regains our destiny, is able to relate to our difficulties, release us from bondage, and restore us from defeat. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Father God, for sending us your one and only Son to become the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. And that if we only believe in this awesome and gracious act of love, we have the promise of the forgiveness of all of our sins and the protection and release from the bondage of the evil one. And life everlasting with you in heaven. Thank you, Father. And we pray this in the holy name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and give you his everlasting strength and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord.